klick nur einmal rechts, links und dann. Passt, alles gut. Alles gut. Wir lassen gleich da liegen.
yeah. and all these men and then flesh them and they came here. Yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times.
please come in and have a seat. That's a belt from uh, goats from the Himalayas we received as a gift. So thank you for taking a minute of silence. And to start this conference, we have seen the waters falling down from the Himalayas like a year ago. Uh, and so that's just a message from out of the world. Uh, I'm Eike Roswa Klinge. Um, head of uh, Natural Building Lab at TU Berlin, uh, and yeah, we are organizing we are organizing the conference. Right to me is Christine Wellner. She is uh, chair of planning and building economics here at uh, our Institute of Architecture. She is dean of the Faculty Six, six Planning, Building, and Environment of TU Berlin, and she is a member of the organization chair and scientific chair. And the both of us will. Uh, moderate this session today. Good morning. <laughs> Dear Mr. Mosley, Policy Officer of the Euro European Commission, we are glad to have you here. Dear Mrs. Kieseltepe, Secretary of State, Federal Ministry of Housing uh, in, in the government, in uh, the Berlin government, we are also welcome you to have you here for this opening. Um, we are joining here, so welcome everybody, welcome uh, yeah, to the participants to take the passion to write papers, to prepare a tough discussion we will have here together on the topic planetary boundaries. And welcome everybody else, so ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have five topics uh, for our conference. One is resource management and material flows. The second is climate natural, neutral buildings. The third is post-fossil infrastructures. Four is critical uh, digitalization. Five is socio-political frames uh, for transition. And then we have also an open call for papers where we you know, add other topics, what we could not imagine like one and a half years ago when we started the conference. So we are here to discuss very open-minded um, the surroundings of the built environment. What we brought into this series is maybe more the social aspects and urban design, and we try to have an integrative view on the built environment, transdisciplinary uh, discussions, what we did yesterday in our, with our pre-events in Tegel and House der Statistik. And yeah, I hope you all will um, bring in good vibes for a good discussion, and we will ho hopefully have a good result tomorrow evening what we can send out again to the world. So we now, Christine, you will take over, just would introduce the uh, scientific chair and please, when you hear your name, just jump up and get up to the stage. We would like to have a photo from the core team of the uh, um, uh, uh, conference. Yes, thank you, Eike. At first I call uh, Professor Thomas Lützkendorf, please come up. Um, he is one of the initiators of the, this conference, and he's also um, a member of the, uh, um, uh, yeah, the um, International Initiative for a Sustainable Built Environment, the IISBE. Um, he's the director of the Center for Real Estate at Karlsruhe um, Institute of Technology, and thank you that you are here. and. Um, thank you for organizing this conference with us. The second party uh, who, you know, introduced me as a young professor here, like I think four years ago, to uh, take over this conference was uh, the BBSR, Federal Institute for Research and Building, Mr. Andreas Rietz. And he is now retired. Um, I'm very glad he is here, still in good connection to his um, uh, institute. And Ms. Uh, Nico Kertz also uh, from the Federal Institute, who take over the seat from Mr. Rietz. And that's uh, office, uh, so the Federal Institute belongs to the Ministry 
of Ms. Kieseltepe. So the Bau Ministerium is a big funder and supporter for our team. So two other partners from the DACH, that means uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, is Professor Alexander Passer from TU Graz, from the Institute of Structural Design, and uh, Professor Guillaume Habert from Zurich. He's um, um, the head of the research group Sustainable Building at ETH Zurich. Welcome. Um, I also welcome uh, the member of the scientific chair of this, of this conference. This is Nina Pavliki. Please come up. She's um, also from the TU Berlin, from the Natural Building Lab. Um, then um, we welcome Professor Susanne Rotter, also from the I TU Berlin. I think she's not yet here, if I see it right. She's yeah. not here? Okay. Um, then Professor Philip Miselwitz from Bauhaus Erde and also a colleague of us. Um, Professor Petra Roth, I think she's also I not think here. Both, no, both not here, yeah. And uh, Professor Catherine De Wolf, um, she's also not here from Zurich. And the most important thing for such a conference is organization. And that is Kim Gundler. Maybe many of you had received like or sended her hundreds of emails. I did, don't know how she managed. But she, she's, she's Miss SBA 22 Berlin. <laughs> we, need also, we would like also to have the, the, the core team of the organization, that is Selina Schletz, Sinali uh, Aram, and Lisa Kolkowski, and Lara, Laura Wenzel. Please get up to the stage as well. And then our two VIPs, please, for a photo. If you just join us just for the photo, uh, Mrs. Kieseltepe and uh, Mr. Mosley, if you just join us for a photo. So how do we manage? Where is our Kim? The, yeah, OK. So should we? So the both of you could stand in the middle and join from So at first, <laughs> Ms. Kieseltepe, you could stay here. Uh, at first, we have an uh, input yeah, uh, from Kanzel Kieseltepe, our Secretary of State, Federal Ministry of Housing, Urban Development and Construction. She's, uh, um, she studied economics at the TU Berlin. So welcome back home, Mrs. Kieseltepe. Thank you very much. I had never thought uh, to hold a speech here in my uh, university. Participants in the SBE 22 Berlin Conference, welcome to Berlin and welcome to SBE 22. Issues of building for the future and of sustainable neighborhood and urban development are very relevant today. I'm especially pleased that institutions in Austria, in Germany and Switzerland have jointly prepared this platform for dialogue with industry, academia, and policymakers, and that, that uh, this conference has attracted interested participants from around Europe and beyond. The topics addressed here in Berlin are central concerns of Germany's Federal Ministry for Housing, Urban Development, and Building as well. In line with the title of this year's conference, Build Environment Within Planetary Boundaries, our efforts are focused on preserving the resources on which our lives depend. We are especially focused on creating more affordable housing for everyone. But in doing so, we must not forget climate change mitigation. On the contrary, the building sector accounts for a large share of Germany's carbon dioxide emissions 
and that is why we are strongly committed to advancing climate-friendly renovation and construction. In future, we must pay more attention to a building's entire lifespan to reduce what are known as grey emissions. We want to establish this as an important parameter for targets, planning and assessment in the construction sector. Requirements that are not tied to specific technologies or materials give more decision-making discretion to those responsible for building, enabling them to seek cost-effective solutions based on the latest research and technology which are best suited to the individual case. This is one basis for ensuring that prices and rents remain affordable for all segments of society. We want to introduce a digital passport for building resources, which would show a building's entire life span, taking into account the developments and requirements at EU level. We are pleased that our quality seal for sustainable buildings has been well received by the market. This seal includes information on life cycle assessments and sustainable sourcing of materials. We will also be introducing a raw materials indicator to promote the conservation of resources. Overall, we should focus much more on the circular economy. A circular economy is about more than just recycling materials or dismantling buildings. It begins at the planning stage with choices that determine whether construction resources will be conserved and whether a building will be durable and able to be used for different purposes. A building which was originally intended as an office block should be able to be used for housing later. The use of sustainable building materials such as wood also arbors great potential. Wood is a renewable raw material that also bins carbon dioxide. And that is why we and the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture are developing a major timber construction initiative. The climate-friendly transformation of forest management is currently generating more coniferous trees than usual. These trees can then be used in the construction sector. We are promoting the innovative use of wood from sustainable forestry and we attach great importance to short supply chains. We have also launched the Future Building Zukunft Bau Innovation Program to support research on renewable raw materials, especially research on timber constructions. In addition to climate-friendly building, we must, of course, ensure that houses in Germany are designed to operate in an environmentally friendly way. That is why, together with the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, we have launched an immediate climate action program for the building sector to advance the use of renewable energy for heating, from solar panels on rooftops to heat pumps in basements. Increasing the use of digital technology in the construction value chain is another important goal. Digital method methods such as Open BIM help to significantly increase the productivity and the efficiency of Germany's construction industry. Through the Alliance for Affordable Housing, the Timber Construction Initiative and our role as a national contact point for the new European Bauhaus, we are actively supporting the necessary processes of transformation. But policymakers cannot simply decree real change in the construction industry. Real change is only possible if all stakeholders pull together. And that's why we are here today, this week, 
Uh, on that note, I hope all participants find this year's SBE 22 interesting and inspiring with lively discussions and intensive exchange among professionals in the field. Thank you for being here. Thanks, thanks Thank for you. this input. We have a, nice, a small present for you, what is a very small thing, but we believe the book of abstract shouldn't, should be on your table, and then you know uh, you will find people you can call if you have questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we have um, a change of our program. Uh, it was a nightmare for us to, you know, think about having a conference under Corona in uh, presence. But luckily, we are happy we are all here now. But our vice president of the uh, TU for uh, sustainability, Sophia Becker, is uh, affected by Corona and staying at home. So she, she will not be here, but she supported us a lot for the conference. But in, on behalf, will Christine Wellner, you know, give us regards from the TU Berlin. Yes, uh, instead of our vice president, Sophia Becker, I welcome you here at the TU Berlin. Um, we are a typical technical university, I could say, with different topics in research, um, like basic research in mechanics, physics, uh, mathematics, and also a lot of applied research, um, like sustainable mobility, work studies, water management, and so on. But the specific, specific uh, characteristics um, of the TU Berlin is um, the integration of life science and so social research. That's, I think that's special for a technical university and um, also the faculty six, where I uh, uh, be the dean of, um, is, um, have involved the Institute for so Sociology um, with technical components. And that's why the that TU Berlin is a good um, host for this uh, conference. And um, because it uh, builds a cross of uh, cross section of all uh, these different research topics, and um, I think that's a good location for this conference. So welcome you again. So this so. is this is one thing I just jumped over. I have to announce our supporters. That's, unfortunately, I've been too quick. I try to come through the program. So um, the team who managed to have this conference, conference here is on the left-hand side, the Natural Building Lab as partner of the DACH network. The DACH network is KIT in uh, Karlsruhe uh, and the TU Graz and the ETH Zurich. We announced the professors already. So we are the core team to organize and manage this conference and we have partners. Uh, that one is the climate change center here in Berlin, what is the uh, program, what is starting to have at the end uh, Einstein Center for Climate Change, hopefully. And then we have the BBSR as a main supporter uh, as a governmental body. We have the government of Berlin through the uh, Senatsverwaltung for traffic and... Uh, um, somewhere so, and uh, the European Commission. And we have media partners you can see there and uh, uh, partners of the SBE network like the UN, etc. And we have support supporters for the students conference, what is very uh, important for us to also involve the next generation into uh, research. Uh, that's also coming from the Zukunft Bau program, pop-up campus, and we are something like a, like a satellite here in Berlin. So just, just to announce our partner. So now we can continue, sorry. So then we have a um, keynote from um, our partners from TU Graz, um, from Alexander Passer. And I don't know, Helga Kromp uh, Kolb, is she yes. here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. May I ask maybe to put on the slides uh, we prepared? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> as a board member of the Climate Change Center Austria, CCCA, it's my pleasure uh, to send you the warmest greetings 
the CCCA, as uh, you might not know, is the Austrian uh, science uh, center uh, where the scientists, in the broadest sense, uh, endeavors to support and speed up Austrians' uh, pathway towards achieving Paris goals. We welcome every activity that brings us forward on the road to sustainability, but we especially appreciate activities by sectors that contribute significantly to carbon emissions and even more important are apt to produce lock-in effects on a large scale. Therefore, we are enthusiastic about SBE Berlin as a very important joint follow-up between the three Central European countries, as it was already mentioned, within the DACH region. Though pleased with the setting of goals and the climate policy rhetoric, the scientists of CCCA are becoming increasingly worried at the lack of real mitigation actions. It is against this background that Professor Helga Kromkolb would have loved to address this in person to you, but accept her honest apologies for not being with us in Berlin. However, it's now my honor to kindly deliver her message, but please remember, it's her professional message, message as a scientist to all of you. Many of you will consider it provocative, but she's just drawing conclusions from what climate science tells us. Thinking the things to the end is mind-blowing, but if we don't think it, uh, reality will take us unprepared. So 50 years um, after the Club of Rome, um, they now have a new book, a new report, and it looks as two scenarios. The first identifies uh, uh, a too little, too late trajectory. It is a continuation of the present trajectory leading to more than three degrees global warming by 2100 and the possible hot earth climate. The dynamic, continuous, uncontrollable increase of temperature that eventually leads to the end of our civilization as we know it. Not an attractive perspective. Not certain, but in words of the scientists, too risky to bet against. The second trajectory, the great leap forward, sounds daunting, but carries the promise of a better, more equitable world. In line with planetary boundaries, the topic of this SBE 22 Berlin conference. It identifies five extraordinary turnarounds necessary to upgrade our economic system, eliminate poverty, reduce inequality, empower women, transform the food system and transform the energy system. Although it seems that climate was not among the prim uh, primary objective, the opposite is true. Only with these turnarounds, so the report, can the climate crisis be resolved, because the necessary changes to achieve Paris goals are so deep cutting. This becomes clear when looking at the global carbon budget. Since, quite, uh, uh, since science is quite robust, regarding the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that goes along with the 1.5 degree scenario on a global level. Subtracting the 2,400 gigatons we already emitted, seen here in, as a gray, uh, the gray part, we have a, a remaining global carbon budget of around 500 gigatons to stay within uh, uh, the scenario in a one to two chance, like 50%. This means that on a global level, carbon dioxide emissions need to be reduced by half till 2030 and net zero be reached by 2050, the dark blue area. As can easily be seen, the current policies, uh, the pledges, will not keep the world within the available carbon budget. What does this mean for industrialized nations? they certainly must reduce faster to leave developing countries a somewhat larger share of the budget. There is a lot of ongoing discussions in science how to distribute the remaining budget, but the purpose for this example, which I will show you, I'll try to keep it very simple. For Austria, which is about one per mil of the global population, this means that our remaining carbon budget 
is 240 to 430 megatons, so one thousandth of the global one. Depending on the likelihood, we would like to limit the temperature increase. This corresponds to a reduction of carbon emissions by 50% anywhere between two and a half or six years. No wonder uh, this really needs turnarounds and super fast turnarounds. But what does this mean for the building sector? The building sector is at present responsible for about 47% of global carbon emissions, whereas buildings itself account 37%, and the embodied share shown here in the picture is 10% of global carbon emissions. We anticipate a similar distribution for Austria. This means, assuming the same share in future, the building and construction sector can claim 240 divided uh, or multiplied by 10% is 24 megatons of CO2 emissions remaining. Values in literature vary, but according to Röck, Hoxha and Rasmussen and others who will have presentations later in the conference, they report roughly 10 to 20 kilograms of embodied carbon emissions per square meter a year. Assuming a 50 life reference study period, this would be equal to 500 to 1 ton per square meters being built. And remember from my calculation, 2050 is only like 25 years away. So going back to my previous equation, um, if we consider one ton of embodied carbon emission per square meter, uh, the remaining budget of 24 megatons means 24 square kilometers can be built to stay within the remaining budget. At present, roughly 23 square kilometers are built in Austria every year. So an overall allowance of 24 square kilometers would mean that there's no remaining budget anymore within one year. Even if we assume low emission building, the number may be doubled or tripled, but this doesn't change the big picture at all. This was a simplified example for building construction in order to get a more comprehensive picture. I'll invite you to other sessions of this conference and I'll especially um, like to invite to Annex 72 activities which show you the broader picture. The need for action is reinforced by other aspects related to carbon storage, food security and biodiversity. Space and soil are very limited resources. The more soil is covered by buildings, the less carbon can be taken up and stored and the more difficult it becomes to maintain biodiversity. In addition, the necessity to switch to more ecological architectural practices for climate reasons, but also for health and biodiversity reasons, the less we can afford to lose land and forests. Switching to more sustainable diets reduced in meat, organic and seasonal uh, and regional activities, it is essential, but is also maintaining available spaces. So what is the vision for our future? We must make do with the buildings we have, make them more climate resilient and develop them continuously to meet the need of changed uses. We will have to move closer together and we will have to adapt the space we use to the varying circumstances of the lifetime. New construction and production methods, new materials will help in the development, but they are no game changer regarding new buildings. Architects and civil engineers in futures will take the pride in creative, functional restructuring solutions but not in exotic buildings on the green field. The building sector as a field of action, therefore, has to reinvent itself and, and must many other sectors. <clears throat> May SBE 22 Berlin be the kickoff of this new era. May the building sector set a great example for other sectors. There is no time to lose. Greta Thunberg said, as long as we focus on what is politically possible instead of what is necessary, there is no hope. But let's give young generations hope. Let's keep the built environment within the planetary boundaries. 
Helga and I wish great discussions and creative meetings. Many thanks. Yeah, life has changed. We received an email tonight from Maya Göppel that her kid is sick. So we have a, a, a switch in our program, but we are lucky to have Philipp Misselwitz here from Bauhaus Erde, and he will uh, give us an input um, in, on behalf. Uh, yeah, Maya Göppel will not be possible, but on your perspective, Philipp. And um, we hope that we can get Maya Göppel in the program for tomorrow, but we will see if that will happen. So. Philip, very nice to have you here, and we are pleased to hear your perspective. Thank you very much. I think the slides are coming up. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, I cannot replace um, Maya Göppel, of course, and uh, I also have to warn you that some of the excellent remarks of my colleague, uh, Mr. Passer, um, I will reinstate and reinforce in my lecture, so um, hopefully uh, making uh, similar remarks twice uh, occasionally um, at this conference is also uh, appropriate, uh, because we are all talking about very serious changes that we, we need to think about in the built environment. So um, dear um, Secretary of State, um, dear, dear colleagues, dear students, um, I would like to present um, a, some thoughts um, also on the uh, degree to which the built environment is um, causing and uh, the, the planetary crisis and um, through which we need to think the built environment as part of the solution. My lecture is called Reconstructing the Future. I recently, about a year ago, left this university temporarily to join some climate scientists um, around John Schellnuber, who set up the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, uh, PEAK, who have been working on topics for a while that I think in our community as planning practitioners were kind of known, but um, maybe let's face it, let's be honest, uh, maybe, known to, uh, maybe not known to the extent to which we need to take these uh, seriously. We are deeply involved in an ongoing uh, planetary crisis. And this is, to a large degree, an urban crisis. If we look at the ongoing and accelerating urbanization globally, we know that we need to reckon with about two to three billion additional urban dwellers by 2050. We may, if we continue with business as usual, with current building practices, we may triple the land consumption we already have. Uh, we have a tremendous um, investment in the sector, and we already know that about 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions are caused directly by the sector. Depending on what you include and what you exclude, these calculations go up to 70%. So there is a huge damaging project going on. How do we face this? And, and this urbanization project um, is uh, very much also a material crisis. This is a recent study published last year where for the first time on the, on the planet we have more anthropogenic mass, um, the kind of stuff that cities are made of, asphalt, minerals, bricks, uh, concrete, than the remaining biomass. We already heard these very alarming figures from Austria. In uh, Germany, these are uh, not much different. I will spare you uh, the details, but we know that the construction sector is nearly, uh, uh, not, not nearly uh, changing fast enough as it should in order to reduce um, carbon emissions. Um, we very much continue business as usual in many cities in Germany, continuing to um, consume more land at the periphery of cities uh, for logistic networks, infrastructures, uh, business parks, also uh, the famous single-family homes uh, in Germany uh, that is very difficult for municipal officials or planners to question. We continue to destroy embodied carbon in our cities and replace them with quite questionable uh, architecture that doesn't really deserve uh, detailed description. And um, in cities, 
Oops. In cities, we are beginning to... No? Okay, this one... Uh, uh, Okay, I'll leave that slide out. It was um, uh, supposed to show actually um, the urban fabric of Munich and the heat island effect uh, that we are experiencing there. Um, and uh, these are some floods, how actually in the last two years, through forest fires, through floods, um, also German cities were directly affected by climate change. This was a wake-up call for our society here. And some of the damages that our... Uh, current way of building and organizing our cities um, is causing is externalized in, uh, uh, in, in landscapes that are uh, sometimes at the margins of Europe or even outside of Europe uh, related to uh, extractivism of fossil based materials. We could say stop building, you know, stop, um, uh, stop uh, damaging radically uh, the built environment through a moratorium on new construction. But if we look at the global perspective, and in a session later on today, um, I have the pleasure to um, introduce you to some um, excellent inputs from other parts of the world. This argument is too simple. Um, I mentioned already that we have two to three billion people moving into cities, not in Europe, where you see these green dots, uh, not in uh, the US or in the old industrial countries, but mainly in developing countries where, um, where all these kind of new constructions will take place. And if we know that if, if those constructions take place using current practices, mainly relying on steel and concrete, we will globally run towards a three to four degree global warming. So all our efforts would be rendered um, uh, 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 meaningless um, if we don't consider this as a kind of global effort and if we if we don't succeed in actually steering this urbanization process um, into a more sustainable direction. Current commitments, as was already outlined by, my previous, um, by the previous input, are not nearly enough. Um, if we uh, accumulate all the global commitments, we still would um, just about reach um, a warming result of two to three degrees, which are way beyond what societies can bear, climate scientists tell us. And as was already outlined in a slightly different diagram, we know the damaging impact of the construction sector, but actually the, um, do I have a, we know that we need to decarbonize by 2050, but what we don't know and what is not recognized sufficiently also by the IPCC is what comes after. You know, in the second part of, of this diagram, um, the built environment is not considered to be part of that. Uh, we rely to a large extent on geoengineering technology that we don't even know yet and that is very likely to be a very risky gamble with the Earth system. So this is where um, our thinking at Bauhaus Earth starts. How can the built environment not only decarbonize but actually go beyond and become part of the solution? And um, in this diagram, you have a quick overview of what, what, what has happened in the last um, a million, in the last, let's say, 250 million years, the um, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere um, uh, was slowly reduced, forming a sort of um, a terrestrial carbon pool. Um, the first, the first um, uh, element of this uh, section, and the second one shows how how we have managed in only 250 years, compared to 250 million years, in only 250 years, we have since the Industrial Revolution managed to largely spend this carbon pool and blow it into the atmosphere. So we need to radically change the way we organize our cities and buildings. We all know this um, in order to um, add to um, carbon sequestration and um, carbon uh, atmospheric carbon uh, uh, extraction. The natural systems that need to be stabilized um, are no longer able, they're so fragile, they're no longer able with uh, coping with this overload. So the built environment comes in as part of the solution. And what I'm referring here is the potential to, for biogenic materials to actually uh, store carbon for a long time and in combination with a sustainable management of forests that would, through natural solutions, photosynthesis, uh, extract new carbon, 
um, they, become, uh, they could become, so we think, part of a uh, construction um, uh, pump uh, taking out additional uh, atmospheric carbon. So this is simply showing how biogenic materials, if this construction demand for these two to three billion people worldwide would, uh, would be um, met with a significant increase of biogenic materials, we could not only avoid all these additions, additional uh, carbon emissions, but we could also actually add a huge um, carbon sink in the built environment. Do we have enough biogenic materials worldwide? Um, we don't know yet for sure. There are every week, every month, are interesting studies coming out. Some are very much warning against this argument, uh, particularly from uh, environmentalists. We hear uh, that um, additional use of uh, biogenic materials um, by the construction sector could critically endanger uh, the remaining biomass. I mean, this is a very serious argument that we have to take very, very seriously. Other studies, like the recent studies by German WWF, are arguing a little bit more uh, carefully that acknowledging the risk of a new extractivism destroying remaining biomass, uh, but also the potential of uh, forests and uh, agroforestry to become productive if they go hand in hand with sustainable management and actually um, a replenishing of the biomass on Earth. So. Our hypothesis is that it is somehow possible, and we are also beginning to study together with colleagues at PEAK and our organization Bauhaus Earth uh, to identify these risk corridors uh, that we might have uh, to actually um, use biogenic material without destroying uh, the natural systems um, and, in fact, replenishing the natural systems. Um, Climate scientists and uh, system uh, physics have sometimes very simple kind of uh, 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 ways of sort of telling us the story through equations. So, um, you know, a recent calculation um, uh, actually resulted in this figure. If we, if we do plant 500 billion trees worldwide, if it was possible, I know it's difficult, I know it might not be possible, but let's say we do it, um, 50 trees per earthling, uh, we would be able to stabilize um, the climate and also meet all the construction demand in developing countries um, and including our own uh, for better cities, better houses, more dignified um, uh, urban environments. So what we need, and I know I'm uh, running out of time, um, what we need is a, is a kind of new paradigm. Uh, we believe that goes beyond uh, carbon reduction um, towards uh, actually a regenerative built environment that positively contributes uh, to climate change. Um, uh, we feel that um, the agendas uh, that have been um, the agenda setting uh, craze since 2015, um, including the Paris outcomes, the, the SDGs, and many other agendas have not yet fully focused on this material crisis and its consequences. So we need altogether make conference like this, uh, strong platforms for pushing this narrative into the global discourse. We have also at Bauhaus Earth recently assembled um, a very illustrious uh, group of uh, politicians, climate scientists, architects like Francis Quere, also our Ministry for Building and Construction, uh, Clara Geiwitz here on the right, um, or Ursula von der Leyen in Rome, and we have um, debated this and published a charter which I will not go through, uh, but uh, I just want to alert you to it, uh, called uh, Towards Re-Entanglement, a Charter for the City and the Earth. And I just want to use two more minutes to introduce you to some of the principles that are laid out in this charter as another attempt, like many, and like hopefully also this conference, uh, to push this narrative into the global space. Um, the first goal, the first principle that is, is laid out in this uh, charter is called Invest in Nature. This relates to the realization that nature, only nature is sophisticated enough through so-called nature-based solutions to help us repair and address the planetary crisis. And this is nature that doesn't only mean protecting primordial forests or so-called frontier forests and uh, very sensitive 
um, uh, uh, forest areas, but also bringing more nature into cities, uh, help us, helping us, we all know this, with climate adaptation, but also, and we should really take this much more seriously, with climate mitigation through carbon storage. Um, the second principle I want to quickly mention, and I'm having trouble here with this, I don't know where to point this, for it to work. Here we go. I'll go quickly through this. Crucially, and sorry, time, time wise, I'm fine? Okay, good, excellent. Um, crucially, and, and this I'm, I'm quite passionate about, I think we need to bring together the different um, disciplines that we have addressing the built environment. We are still too much socializing and working in bubbles um, of engineering, architecture, um, often quite distant from urban development specialists and other urban professional, professionals who have broader perspectives um, on systemic linkages and connections in cities. Um, and also we, we don't nearly sufficiently enough manage to actually bring governance across these different scales together. We, we have, uh, we know this from Berlin, um, a terribly sectoralized and fragmented urban governance um, that, that simply does not uh, get into view and uh, does not manage to actually oversee or guide the kind of metabolisms and systemic relationships between nature and cities um, uh, invested in resource flows of building materials, of foods, of, of water. Um, we have a fragmentation of jurisdictions between cities and rural hinterlands. We know this, how difficult, terribly difficult it is to get Berlin and Brandenburg to work together. Very frustrating. We need to radically change this in order to actually um, be able to think and govern the kind of uh, nature city re-entanglement um, that we need um, in order to um, progress from fossil-based cities towards, towards uh, bioregionality. My predecessor also mentioned bio-based um, circular economies in the building sector, and I would fully endorse this um, uh, uh, in relation to my previous remarks on biogenic materials that we desperately need, but also recycling, uh, reuse, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, also buildings, I think, to a much larger degree than ever before, become reservoirs uh, protecting biodiversity. We know this from Berlin-Brandenburg. Again, we have a higher biodiversity in the city than in the countryside that has been damaged by decades um, uh, long industrial uh, uh, agriculture. And um, uh, thirdly, my, my core argument, we have to really sort of think through the potential of buildings, building materials kept for as long as possible in the building cycle to actually become carbon banks. And this sort of systemic relationship um, that we want to propagate uh, really is about a co-transformation of um, our management of bioresources uh, regionally, um, uh, how we harvest it sustainably, how we process this and bring this uh, in an increasing way into the urban environment um, through uh, refurbishment, um, uh, densification projects, and also um, uh, new construction projects, a little bit less hopefully here uh, in Central Europe than what we need um, in other parts of the world, keeping this as long as possible in these kind of urban systems um, <clears throat> uh, through what cities are always good at, through cultures of sharing, of, uh, uh, of, um, of exchanging, of um, creatively sort of managing uh, the existing and creating though an incentive, an economic incentive also for a reinvestment in afforestation and uh, uh, agroforestry. So this kind of uh, complete circle um, with all its complexities, all its difficulties um, uh, needs to be thought in order to actually finally uh, manage this relationship of um, carbon capturing and carbon storage. Um, and we are interested in exploring this at Bowers Earth and I'm sure at this conference we have many, many interesting contributions that might be thought of as elements, puzzle pieces in this systemic transformation that we all need. Um, again, at um, 11.30, I think we have um, a, a short session that I'm inviting you to looking at various global perspectives on this. And if you're interested to look more into the charter, um, here it is uh, online. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Philip. Um, and now I welcome um, again Philip Mosley. Um, he is a keynote for us. Um, she's the, uh, he is the, sorry, uh, the policy officer at European Commission, DG Grove Construction Unit. He's working on the green transition of the construction industry in Europe, including energy and resource efficiency. Thank you very much. And uh, oh, do I have a pointer here? Yes, this one is it. So it's uh, fantastic to be back here in Berlin, about 25 years after I did my Erasmus exchange here. Uh, so uh, what a pleasure. Um, of course, I've been in Berlin since then, but uh, <laughs> um, very nice to be here amongst so many uh, um, extremely intelligent people as well on this subject. Um, so I'm, I'm working in the uh, Directorate General for the Single Market and Industry. That's what DG Grow means. Um, so we are concerned with the competitiveness of construction. Um, but I personally am working very much on uh, the life cycle uh, emissions of construction and um, uh, the green transition, as, as we call it now, in the, the current buzzword. Um, we've, heard a, we've seen a lot of statistics on uh, the global uh, problems that we have and um, also some national ones. Here are some EU statistics on um, construction. First of all, its economic importance, of course. It's uh, almost 10% of gross value added. We're talking about millions of jobs and millions of companies, almost all of which are small and medium enterprises. And um, the majority of those are micro enterprises. Um, so it's a very particular uh, ecosystem. And um, uh, we are, have with the EU industrial strategy, uh, 14 industrial ecosystems, of which construction is um, one of the biggest. I think it's the second biggest. Uh, and also, of course, uh, as we've heard, construction has a, a huge environmental impact. And uh, um, I can highlight that it is the single biggest source of waste in the EU. Uh, so more than a third of all waste generated. And unfortunately, that figure is going up rather than down. Um, and it's also. Uh, buildings uh, and, and construction responsible for roughly half of, of the EU's extracted resources. So what we're doing and what I'm going to try and do with this um, uh, presentation is give you a kind of uh, overview as much as possible of the EU policies um, dealing with, uh, with all of this. Um, we're working currently on a, a document called a transition pathway. So each of these 14 ecosystems is developing a transition pathway. Um, and this is, uh, these three words go together, the green transition, the digital, but also uh, a more resilient industry. Um, so this is a, a document that's really looking forward at how we can get the green and digital transitions working together, uh, and how we can also make the industry more resilient um, with that. In order to produce this work, we've been working with the High Level Construction Forum, which is a, um, a regular meeting of member state governments, uh, stakeholders of industry, also academia, also NGOs, uh, all together with the European Commission. Um, and uh, we've, um, we've first of all produced a consultation document in uh, late 2021, which set out some uh, scenarios for these uh, transitions uh, by 2030. And um, this just shows the process of, of going through this transition pathway um, that we started with the industrial strategy itself. Uh, we convened the, the forum, first of all. Uh, we had many uh, consultations. Uh, we produced the staff working document, the SWD there. Um, and then we had various uh, online surveys as well as events uh, and discussions with uh, industry and, uh, and also other representatives. And now we are at the stage where um, after having had various thematic sessions of the forum looking at some of these different aspects, including uh, life cycle carbon, uh, we're at the drafting stage now near the end. Uh, we're aiming to uh, publish this transition pathway either at the end of this year or 
It might shift into early next year, but that is the plan of having this transition pathway out. Uh, what it will in practice look like, um, it won't be a very long document, but uh, it will make some recommendations for action, some future action beyond which uh, the, the Commission's already committed, but recommend uh, areas for further work. Um, so these are some of the um, areas that the transition pathway is looking at. We have, of course, the whole life carbon or, or, uh, uh, in there under the green transition. Um, and circularity and waste, uh, waste reduction and waste prevention are in there as well, of course. Uh, building renovation is a major uh, issue to tackle at the moment. Then we also have some of these digital uh, elements, the collaboration tools like BIM, uh, the automation tools like uh, um, uh, robotics and so on, um, the big question of data, which I'm sure you're, you, you know better than I, uh, and then some of these resilience uh, issues such as the skills, uh, the availability of skilled labor, the supply chains, which of course are very much under strain at the moment, and the overall competitiveness of the industry and how we can improve uh, its competitiveness and its uh, productivity. Um, and then it, some of these cross-cutting challenges that apply to all of these include research and innovation and procurement. When it comes to a circular economy, we have uh, a number of actions that are ongoing or recently finished or, or, or starting. Um, under these two uh, overall strategies, on the left, you see the Circular Economy Action Plan, which came out in, in 2020, uh, which was economy-wide, really tr trying to transform the EU into a circular economy. And it had some of these individual actions on construction, demolition, waste. Some of these are, are studies uh, related to uh, the uh, revision of the Waste Framework Directive. And then under the Renovation Wave, which is the uh, plan to at least double uh, the renovation of buildings in the EU. We have a roadmap uh, to reduce whole life cycle carbon in buildings by 2050. That is an action under the renovation wave, which we are starting to work on now. Uh, and then we also have um, some other uh, um, work there ongoing on, on recovery targets that would also be related to the Waste Framework Directive and developing a more green public procurement criteria for different building types. When it comes to whole life carbon, um, we, uh, I think it's fair to say that a couple of years ago, uh, if I'd been standing here, we wouldn't have had very much to say other than that we have the levels framework to measure and report on uh, um, life cycle emissions. Uh, levels is the um, scheme for sustainability in buildings. There are 16 indicators and one of them is uh, global warming potential. Um, but once, uh, now that levels has been established and is being used in the industry, and we, we really encourage uh, the industry to use it, uh, it is um, enabling us now to um, uh, develop some other policies and it's making its way into various different initiatives. The first of which, uh, after levels, was the EU taxonomy uh, for sustainable activities. Um, uh, which is the, uh, the, the initiative to um, harmonize the way uh, sustainability reporting is done for financial institutions and to um, uh, develop criteria, harmonized criteria for sustainable investment. We also have the roadmap that I, that I mentioned already that is under development. And then really now we are getting into legislation as well. So we have these proposals to revise the energy and climate uh, legislation, which was the huge uh, package that came out uh, last year to deal with the target, the overall EU target to reduce emissions by 55% by 2030. Um, so life cycle emissions in, in construction are addressed uh, in different ways in the Energy Efficiency Directive and in the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. So briefly on those, the Energy Efficiency Directive includes um, some provisions to try and discourage, uh, uh, de discourage demolition and reconstruction over renovation uh, when public authorities would need to meet uh, renovation targets. They, they would need to renovate 3% of all public buildings per year. 
uh, and um, in order to do that, uh, we, we don't want them to be uh, demolishing and reconstructing uh, instead of renovating. And then in the EPBD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, um, the proposal now is that all buildings would need to calculate and declare their life cycle global warming potential um, by 2030 and a larger building slightly earlier in 2027. And there's a, there's a lot of debate going on now because once the Commission proposal is out, it is of course debated with the, in the Parliament and the Member States also are um, uh, debating this and then there will be negotiations between all three institutions. Um, there are a lot of uh, conversations going on about these dates. Um, uh, wh whether they are early enough or whether they are feasible uh, and also uh, the requirement to only calculate and declare but not set limit values uh, as some member states are already uh, proposing to do at a national level. Um, that is also something, for example, the Parliament is call calling for uh, limit values to be imposed as well. So that is an ongoing debate. And then we have uh, slightly more recently, in March this year, we had the proposal to revise the construction products regulation, which I'll get onto in a little bit more detail. So here we are. The, um, the construction products regulation is the EU regulation that lays down EU-wide rules for marketing of construction products. So um, what it does uh, provides a common technical language to assess the performance of construction products. And it ensures that reliable information is available so that the performance of products from different manufacturers in different countries can be compared. Um, and the, the CPR is now undergoing a revision to improve the functioning of the EU single market for construction products and to provide, uh, to better integrate sustainability requirements. The overall vision for the regulation is, uh, and the revision of it is to boost uh, the internal market for construction products and also to promote their environmental sustainability. Um, we want to improve the competitiveness of construction and unlock its potential for jobs and growth. This will help the industry to deliver a more sustainable built environment, including improved safety and health. And the green transition and the circular economy will open new possibilities for business models and innovation. And in parallel, the digital transition of construction will help make use of product data for example, using digital building logbooks and conducting the life cycle analysis of buildings. So what we're basically doing here is we're moving from a situation of voluntary declarations uh, to mandatory declarations for construction products. So at the moment, uh, many construction products on the market declare their environmental performance using EPDs. Uh, and this information is, is useful for designers. Um, under the new CPR revision, we also want to implement progressively a set of mandatory declarations of environmental criteria, starting with global warming potential. So uh, global warming potential would be a mandatory uh, declaration for all construction products. Um, and this process will be integrated in the regulatory framework of the CPR and linked to the placing of the product on the market. And third party validation will be done by notified bodies. And overall, we want to ensure harmonization of the reporting of environmental and other performances. So um, as I mentioned already, we have the, the challenge to renovate buildings in Europe. This is actually one of the biggest practical challenges, I think, facing the, facing the construction industry in Europe, uh, to at least double or, or triple, really, the annual rate of building renovation. So, so the task we're facing is absolutely colossal. We have over 220 million building units in Europe that were built before 2001, so they're not up to the current uh, standards. We're, we're looking at enormous amounts of money that would need to be mobilized for this renovation wave but it's also an enormous opportunity for the construction industry. Uh, the 160,000 additional green jobs in construction, uh, which was estimated when the renovation wave um, 
uh, strategy was first unveiled is probably now a conservative figure. Um, but we have a rule of thumb there of 12 to 18 local jobs per million euro spent. So, so that is really um, an ongoing initiative that is making its way now into various um, policies and initiatives such as uh, the recovery funds that have been made available to the member states to recover from the corona uh, virus. Uh, there are, in most of those plans now, large amounts of money going towards the renovation wave. And then, of course, uh, everything gets turned upside down with uh, um, uh, the economic shock of the coronavirus and also the e current economic shock of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what this has done to material prices, which have gone uh, quite uh, insanely high, and also the energy prices, of course. Um, so uh, the, the transition pathway document that I mentioned will, of course, address some of these issues. Um, there, we know that uh, manufacturers of construction products, especially the energy intensive ones, are under huge strain now uh, with the high energy prices. Uh, and it is a worry that um, uh, certain, uh, uh, there are reports of certain manufacturers will have to pause some of their manufacturing. Um, so this is really a, a, a period of great disruption at the moment. But nevertheless, a lot of these um, plans are ones that will take us through the medium and long term. Uh, just um, uh, a further word on the EU taxonomy, because this is such an important subject, especially for, for financing and, and uh, uh, the financial institutions supporting construction work. So in order to meet the EU's climate and energy targets uh, for 2030 and reach the objectives of the European Green Deal, uh, it's vital that we direct investments towards sustainable projects and activities. And to achieve this, a common language and a clear definition of what is sustainable is needed. And this is why the action plan on uh, financing sustainable growth called for the creation of a common classification system uh, for sustainable economic activities. And this is what is the EU taxonomy. And a first a delegated act on sustainable activities for climate change, adaptation and mitigation, um, was published in the official journal on the 9th of December 2021 and is applicable since January of this year. And a second delegated act for the remaining objectives, which you can see there, um, water, biodiversity, pollution and circular economy, uh, is expected to be published uh, uh, later this year. Um, so we're working at the moment now uh, on these uh, criteria and they've, uh, we've received from the platform for sustainable finance, which is the kind of stakeholder expert groups um, that developed these criteria and recommended them to the Commission. Uh, we've received these recommendations and we're looking at those now. Quite apart, apart from uh, all this uh, policy making, uh, of which there's a lot, <laughs> as you can see, um, we also have some studies. Uh, so there's one here on uh, trying to understand better what the construction industry is actually doing on the ground when it comes to the circular economy. Um, so this study is aiming to elaborate on uh, current measures um, which we, we know we, we have some statistics like Eurostat statistics on waste and so on, but um, investigate uh, how and to what extent the actors in the construction industry ecosystem are considering and applying circular approaches and what drives them or hinders them to do so. And so um, it will investigate at the company level and uh, propose indicators that in, in particular SMEs are capable of reporting against and are willing to report against uh, so that we can um, uh, learn more about what the industry is actually doing. This is um, actually uh, a, a wonderful initiative uh, on public procurement. I had the pleasure of going to Oslo two weeks ago to visit zero emission construction sites. Uh, this big buyers initiative brings together big public buyers such as cities and national infrastructure uh, works providers 
and it gets them to exchange on best practices and also um, they, they exchange with industry on what, the, what is the best that industry is able to offer so that they put that into their public procurement. Um, and is, in Oslo I visited one of these zero emission sites and I highly recommend it to any of you who get a chance to visit a zero emission site. Uh, to, it's quite something to see a silent construction site with uh, electrified diggers and uh, lorries uh, and machinery making no noise. Uh, in fact, the site that I visited, which was um, a water and sewage infrastructure works uh, right next door to a kindergarten, and the, um, the lady who was the project manager for, the, for this site was telling us that normally in the past, uh, when Oslo had diesel-powered machinery, um, they used to have uh, in their permit, in their build, uh, construction permit, uh, a legal clause that said they had to stop work when the children were sleeping next, in the kindergarten next door. And now, uh, when we were there, the children were making more noise than the construction site. So it was uh, actually a, a very nice to see. Um, we also uh, published some years ago now some guidance on construction and demolition waste, this uh, management protocol, which is available in, in 15 languages. And uh, we developed this together with industry, and it's still quite widely used. Um, and we've had a, a lot of good feedback about this document, but it is getting a little bit old now and need, needs to be updated. Uh, it was published originally in 2016 uh, and followed uh, in 2018 with some guidance on waste audits before demolition. And so therefore, we're planning from next year to start looking at updating this guidance to better take account of the renovation wave and also to integrate um, some more guidance on, on subjects like uh, asbestos. And then uh, there's the new European Bauhaus is a, another initiative. Um, uh, of course, this is quite a, a wide-ranging initiative. Um, so uh, launched by our president, Ursula von der Leyen, in, in October of 2020. Um, so it, it aims to make the Green Deal a cultural and human-centered and positive, tangible experience. Um, and it integrates three dimensions, uh, sustainability, including the circular economy, first of all, the quality of experience, including aesthetics of design, and also inclusion, including affordability and accessibility. Uh, and it follows three phases. The first of all, the, the scheme was designed from 2021, so there was a design phase. Then we are now in a delivery phase, 2021 to 23, um, to develop a support framework. And uh, what the Bauhaus is, is it's being implemented across various different EU uh, funds and programs, like the regional funds, uh, the Horizon Europe program, uh, and various others. Um, and then from next year onwards, there will be a dissemination phase to spread uh, the Bauhaus ideas beyond, beyond the EU's borders. Uh, you can see here the, the very wide spread of policies that integrate now the Bauhaus into their, into their work. On the left there you see the, the huge list of, uh, of policies under the European Green Deal uh, because that is such an important uh, priority for this Commission, but also the various other um, policy areas that are now integrating the Bauhaus's ideals uh, into the work, including, as you see on the very right, the industrial strategy that is um, what we are working on in DG Grow. Uh, and finally, uh, just to mention um, some of the funding available for uh, uh, construction and, and research and innovation in particular here, uh, the Horizon Europe program, uh, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, but um, just it's fair to say that it, it really um, uh, has support for building and construction related research and innovation across the whole programs, dotted throughout. I've highlighted three of the clusters here, but really there are building and construction related uh, topics in other areas as well. Um, but the main ones, I would say, first of all, uh, cluster four, which looks at the competitiveness and the digital green transition of the industry itself. So really trying to improve the competitiveness of construction and reduce uh, um, it, the waste it creates and so on. Um, then cluster five 
uh, looks more at the sustainable built environment, so more angled towards the end product, let's say, in particular with the Built for People partnership, which is a um, public-private partnership. So the private side of the partnership gets to input into the topics along with the Commission. Um, and also the, the unique thing about the Built for People partnership is it a whole value chain approach. So it looks at uh, trying to get innovation working through the value chain to the market um, in a way that perhaps individual projects wouldn't be able to do on their own. Uh, and there's also some support uh, for, in particular, bio-based and circular um, construction practices in Cluster 6. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning, you can see at the bottom there, the European Innovation Council, the EIC, has for the first time a dedicated uh, strand of work for construction. Um, so there is, uh, this, this is supporting startups and individual um, SMEs. Um, so that's also an interesting area to look at, and they're particularly looking at some of these um, new technologies, uh, innovation in things like robotics and, and, and so on. Uh, and then also much smaller than Horizon Europe, but still uh, important, is the LIFE program, uh, which now integrates climate, energy, and environment. Uh, and um, there is some support for buildings related work in the LIFE program, in particular uh, some skills, uh, circular economy, and there are some elements of the new European Bauhaus in here as well. Um, and uh, support for the renovation wave is in there too. That is uh, all from me. I've, I hope you've uh, managed to take in all this information about what the EU is doing because there's really <clears throat> quite a lot going on all at once. Um, and uh, it says th thank you in several languages there, which are the ones I, I speak, but uh, I can also say danke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have I micro? Micro, micro, micro. Micro, Peter. So here we are. Thank you very much, Mr. Mosley. And yeah, we are lucky to have the European Commission what is setting the, the levels high for us uh, as on our political systems here in Germany, we are still in, uh, uh, in struggle to get things through. But um, yeah, very interesting to see where it goes through. So unfortunately, you as a keynote speaker, uh, you're not getting a tree because we don't know how you travel and it's hard for trees to travel by a person. So we have this fantastic light mill. Uh, it's a gift from Thomas in person who brought all these uh, fantastic small things from uh, Turinga. Thank you very much. So now it's go we are going to start working. So first of all, I would like to say a big thank you to Patrick Dreyer. I don't know if he is in the room. He is around. He is the graphic designer for all these nice gimmicks and guides you have, to, uh, your, your um, posters, etc. And he did this also this very nice book of abstract. And um, Thomas is now guiding through the program and telling you um, how the steps will follow. And Thomas, for sure, is master of the scientific program. And I just would like to announce that we have these cards in the back and you can write your thoughts and proposals, what we should take in consideration if we sum up and write it down here. You can take this out of the book and then there will be a box at the registration desk where you can put it on. And then we will summary that on tomorrow evening. So, Thomas. Yes, stay with me because <laughs> we like to say thank you for coming. You know, it was our dream to see you here face to face. And we take a high risk, you know, it was a totally unsure situation. It's able or we will make it or we will make it not. You will see at home looking like the last two years to a screen. But now we can see you face to face. This is what we are looking for. If you feel better, you can use such a well-designed mask. Yeah. We can also make the people nervous in the streets tonight with hundreds of masks, <laughs> we will see. But now I will guide you through the program. And like Mr. Mosley's firework, I will invite you to the firework of our conference here. Thank you, Eike. 
So, and I also like to say thank you to our colleagues making it real. They are working so hard to provide you with the proceedings just in time. And if you look into some tired faces today, now you know the reason. It was a hard job, job to make it real. But from my point of view, it's not just a book of abstracts. It's a piece of art. If you look to this, and this will create good memories to Berlin, we hope. By the way, kind regards also from my hometown, Weimar, where the first Bauhaus comes from. We should know this. 100 years ago, there was already the first Bauhaus. And I can tell you, a Bauhaus, this is more than a thing with a flat roof. Also, 100 years ago, there was a debate how to change the society, how to save energy, how to use new products. And 100 years ago, they are discussing already the idea of embodied coal. There was a ministry, in our days we would call it Ministry for Sustainable Development in Germany 100 years ago, to say, please use construction product materials using less coal to become produced. Wow, 100 years of grey energy. We can learn a lot from the past, but we will also look together into the future. It's now my task to invite you to the scientific program, to the sessions, and to the special fora. So, yes. You know, we have uh, learned already this morning, in a certain way, there is a very clear reason why we are talking about built environment within planetary boundaries. In a certain way, we are in a crisis, not just in a climate crisis. We are leaving the safe operating space, and this is a risk to all of us. That's why we have to act, not just in the field of climate action, but also in others like land use, land use change, resource consumption, and so we have to deal with several topics, especially how we can adapt our way to produce and to consume, but we will translate this into our own language here, so we have to think about how to integrate this into the design of buildings, the further development of national building stocks, development of new construction products, and so on. And our object of assessment is the built environment. This means a lot of things. This is a multi-level approach, and so I will guide you through. You know, this is uh, the main headline of our conference here, Built Environment Within Planetary Boundaries. But what does it mean? We have to think about science-based targets. And in this case, we will take the planetary boundaries as a starting point for a top-down approach. It's no longer enough to think about economic and technical feasibility. We have to respect something like absolute sustainability taking the boundaries as a starting point to define our new type of benchmarks following a top-down approach. To do so, we need a system of targets and indicators. For sure, global warming potential or greenhouse gas emissions is a very important indicator, but we need a system of indicators to deal also with all the other important areas of protection or indicators. And we have to take urgent actions as different scale. Therefore, and I invite you, now you have in front of you this beautiful book, and if you open it, you will feel and find the program and the site plan. And so perhaps uh, you can uh, take out this leaflet here, and uh, I can explain you the structure of the program and the audios behind. So in a certain way, I will help you to find your way. You know, I'm too old to be a lift boy. You can call me elevator man. So. But uh, now let's jump into the elevators. Let's start at level one. What is behind the product level? OK, there is no surprise. In this case, we will deal with circular material systems and we will deal with different types of construction products using renewable and more or less traditional products. We will talk about LCA and environmental product declarations, and there is also a special fora dealing with the EBDs in a digital way. You know there's already an international standard 
and a, uh, a funny new term, bimmelbe, bimmable. You know how we can make EPD bimmelbe, bimmable, to be able to integrate this into a building integrated modeling. So, how is this is organized in our program here? You know, first of all, there is a package of sessions dealing with circularity, and one is related to the construction products. And there is tomorrow a larger option to deal with uh, the different types of materials and the latest developments in construction product application and development. There is also a very special session dealing with uh, life cycle assessment for construction products tomorrow. And I like to highlight this especially. There is a special forum for digital environmental product declarations organized by colleagues here from Berlin. So this is what we are able to offer on the product level. On the building level, by the way, if we go to this one, we can uh, see there is something like assessment methods. We will present immediately after this opening a special fora presenting uh, the results of International Energy Agency Annex 72. And I have a special welcome to my colleagues from all over the world because this was an international activity, International Energy Annex 72. And so immediately after this opening, we will start with this. But we will also talk about climate neutral buildings and timber construction and how this is uh, uh, here in the program. Based on this example, I can explain you a certain job sharing between special fora and scientific sessions. So I mentioned already the special fora Annex 72. But later on, if you become interested in this topic of climate neutral buildings, this special fora is followed by two other sessions dealing also with benchmarks and climate neutral buildings. So this special fora and the following sessions are closely uh, creating a package, let us say. But there is much more. There is more about the buildings. And we can now jump to the city level also very important level, and my colleagues here in Berlin are dealing with this in a more intensive way. So by the way, we are talking about here about the housing strategies, the circularity, energy renovation, and urban governance. You will find this especially in our program, in your program tomorrow. There is something about the urban planning and the urban governance in our program. On the stock level, and this can be a national building stock, it can be a regional building stock, but it can also be an institutional building stock. In any case, we have to deal with our stocks. So we are talking about refurbishment, retrofitting, but there's also a special piece, and uh, my colleague from Austria, Alexander Passer, highlighted already this morning, do not forget the infrastructure. Typically, we are talking about the houses, the residential buildings, office buildings, and so on. But there are much more resource-consuming constructed assets, like bridges, roads, and others. So we have also to take into account the infrastructure. So already today, immediately after this opening here, we have uh, first uh, sessions in relation to the building stock and you can also see here the package, and we will discuss tomorrow some thing, special things in relation to the infrastructure. And there are some special topics, like, uh, let us say, very important still, life cycle impact assessment from methodological point of view, digitalization, and you know, we are talking a lot of strategies to achieve a more sustainable built environment. Typically, we are talking about efficiency and consistency to use more renewables or to be regenerative. But there is one another very important strategy, sufficiency. And here in Germany, but also in your home countries, there is also an ongoing debate how we can reduce our demand and how we can create a more sufficient approach. And in a certain way, since several years, we are 
try to uh, enlarge system boundary. Because typically, we are talking about construction product industry, construction industry, and the designers. And sometimes there is a debate, are the designers are well trained, are they ready, are there enough tools? But from my point of view, we forget the clients. Who will write the client's brief? And therefore, we have to discuss economy in the field of uh, construction industry, or let me say, real estate industry. In a certain way, we have also to teach the clients, the fund managers, the property owners, and people like this. And therefore, it's so important also for the young designers not to become an economist, but to learn the language of the client and the property agent to allow a conversation. And again, we have to train also such people to ask for the still buildings and to create a willingness to pay for such buildings. And therefore, it's also very important to, have, to make a very clear message. Unsustainable buildings are a risk in our days. And that's why we should also go this way. And I'm happy to see such a topic here in our program. We will talk about transformation. And I'm happy to see a lot of colleagues from other universities here in the room. We have to talk about how to educate, how to educate the designers, the civil engineers, but also, especially also in my case, how to educate the clients of the future. So we have uh, in our program here something about the life cycle assessment, again, from a more methodological point of view. We have the education starting immediately. So we are, if you are interested in this topic, please go to this room. And uh, you know, there is also the topic of digitalization. And we are talking about immediately about the sufficiency. So you can see there is also the very special part about the economy and innovation and economy. This is tomorrow. I invite you also to see the beautiful styled poster session outside, but you will also find there some exhibitions. There is also a small possibility to make a contact to buildings and cities. One of our media partners, you will find outside additional information. There is also a special program for young PhD students, so please make a contact to this box there. Richard Lodge will be waiting for you there. We have the poster session, yes, and you know, from our point of view, the point of view of the organizers, a poster session is just another channel of communication. This is very important to us here. You have the full paper, and there is oral presentation and poster presentation, but there are also very short, high condensed sessions. You will listen to the authors of the posters, and you can get additional information there. So if you like, please visit also the poster sessions to make sure that you can take information from there. And I'd like to invite you to all such uh, special fora, starting immediately. There are different topics like passwords toward a regenerative built environment, digital EPD, calculating national greenhouse gas balance, building this in boundaries, real world laboratories, and I mentioned this already, assessing life cycle related environmental impacts caused by buildings. We are here, and this is also part of your information, so you can see where you are now, and I hope you will find your way. And there are a lot of people outside, young people, not just with tired, but with friendly faces. They will help you uh, to find your place, your room, and I invite again uh, my colleague uh, Eike and Alexander, and hope uh, also Guillaume will be there, to say, let us start the conference together. With, uh, let's go now. So.
Whenever you have questions, whenever you have questions, uh, people are using these vests just to support you, take care for you, and we're going to meet at 11.30 at the age. No, we have now a coffee break at the age room. What is quite complex to find here. It's a beautiful place there, and then also start allocating to your uh, rooms where you then follow the sessions. And if there is press around, so we are ready here to also answer your questions. <laughs>